Jesus is the only way. He's the only name you'll hear on that day. What price will you bring when you stand before the King? upon the water one sweet day He healed the blind and lame All glory to His name Jesus is the only way Jesus is the only way truth and the life I'm here to say. He gave his life for me on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way, folks. The only way. Time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll. Called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there because I love thee you have given life to
Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is He, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise His name. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. He's a Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is He, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise His name. When my cup runneth over with joy, when my cup runneth over with joy, makes it easy to pray, sing and shout every day. When my cup runneth over with joy, mine, mine, constantly He's mine. While I walk this only pilgrim way, mine, mine, constantly He's mine. Jesus is abiding every day. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run, there are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. I want to be more and more like Jesus. I want to be more and more like Him. I want to be more and more like Jesus. I want to be more and more like Him. Mike, you got one? You got a song? For him to sing or play? Yeah, whatever. You sing and play. One what? Huh? Your throat sore? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. So oh. 
Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to gather here together to worship you, to worship in your name, and we thank you, God, creator of heaven and earth, great majestic, majestic Father who has given us, Lord, eternal life. Lord, you have created the heavens and the earth. You are the first and last, the Alpha and the Omega. There is none beside thee. Lord, we present ourselves to you, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Wash us with your blessings, Lord Jesus. Keep us in your will, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Bibles this morning to Ecclesiastics in chapter 5. And uh, Ecclesiastics is a book uh, of the Old Testament. And uh, some have uh, said that Solomon is the author. Others say he is not. It's uh, just a a philosopher. Nevertheless, the writer is uh, uh, speaking of his uh, disillusionments with uh, uh, himself in view of uh, 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 life, uh, the physical life, and uh, the pleasures of this physical life, and some of the disappointments of life, and so on and so forth. So, we're going to uh, look at this in Ecclesiastics in chapter 5, and we're going to start off with uh, verse 18, 19, and 20. Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of his labor, that he, that he uh, uh, taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labors, this is the gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. The enjoyments of life, the writer here is writing and, 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 and expressing that there are enjoyments of life. But there is something here in this that I want to point out, and that is uh, the portions. The portions, here it says, uh, that for it is his portion. And there is an allotment of life that we may say that I have chosen this path, or we may say that this is the way I want to live my life, but I do believe that God chooses our path to some extent and that God gives us a portion of that path. We're responsible for the things that God does for us and for the things that we have. I want to give you a few examples of portions of life in this idea. The first I'm going to use is Saul from the Old Testament. And Saul was seeking his father's lost animal, you remember? And what happened? He ended up being the king of Israel. Was it a coincidence? Was it something that just, he happened to be at the right place at the right time? Some people would say, oh, he, he's, he's famous or he received those things because he happened to be at the right place at the right time. I don't think that's the truth. I believe that God handed to him a portion now, we'll get back to Saul later, but we come to the second one, to uh, Jacob, who had to flee from his household because of Esau, his brother. You remember the story? And how that he went to his uh, relative's place, and uh, there he was uh, uh, waiting at a well, and there was a cover on the well, and he was waiting there, probably thirsty, and along comes a young maiden whose name was Rachel. So our second character in this morning's story is Rachel, who comes to the well. And we'll talk a little bit more about Rachel. But Rachel, here she finds this man, and he uncovers the well, he gives her a kiss, and they go back to the father's house. And so we have Rachel. In the third one, in our third story, we find it in the New Testament, we find a man named Levi. Now, Levi was a tax collector, and he was doing his job. He was on his job, doing his job, and one day Jesus comes along, and Jesus says, come and follow me. And the tax collector 
we know the story of how he became one of the twelve. God has a hand in our life. We are going about our daily routine. We seem to think that this is the way, uh, you know, I choose this and I did this and I did that. But we are going about our daily routine and God has a plan and he administers a portion of something in our life. And a lot of people don't like to hear that, but that's absolutely what God does. Now, in verse 19, it says that every man also to whom God has given riches and wealth, the promise uh, of the power to eat thereof, temporal gifts that God gives us, these riches here. Here it says every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth. Wow! You mean to tell me that God actually gives good gifts, material good gifts like this? Yes, He does. So God gives a, a, among us getting our portion are the wealth and riches that God gives us. He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got the whole wide world in His hands. He's got the whole He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Boy, we use a drummer on this one. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. I always think of riches as a relative term, you know? What is rich? Well, we could always point to somebody who doesn't have something that we have and say, well, they're poor and I'm rich. And we could always find somebody who has something that we don't have and we could say, he's rich and I'm not rich. But I believe that riches are uh, uh, within us. The riches are within us. And we have certain things, and God has blessed us with certain riches, and we should be uh, 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 remembering those things. Now we'll go on. We're going to go back to this, but we're going to go on to verse 20, and it says, For he uh, shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. Here actually this says that God, uh, that man will not seriously remember, not take to heart, our lot in life because God is speaking to the heart and the peace of God is greater than the worldly pleasures that we are receiving. So that the things that we have materially in this life, while we enjoy them, while we seem to have them and, and enjoy those things, the things that God can place in our heart, the riches, the spiritual riches that God places will help us to and make us and cause us even to forget those things in life and the things that we have. Some people have said, oh, this is a verse that says uh, we won't remember our life when we go into the next life. That's not true. That's not true. And this is talking about the material things and the things of this life. Now, whatever our po portion or our lot in this life, whether it is great riches or a few pennies, God has a hand in our portions. Now I want to go back to and talk about the three characters that we were speaking of in the scripture. The first one being Saul. Saul uh, uh, was the chosen of God that he became the king of Israel. But I want to go back and see uh, within the portion that God had given him and some of the circumstances of his life. 
Here's a man who was one of the smaller tribes he belonged to and uh, not very famous, not very well known. The, the, his father was a farmer and had uh, some uh, animals. And uh, one day we find that one of the animals or a few of the animals that the father had had wandered off. Wow, what a coincidence, had wandered off. And they wandered off and so... Uh, 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 Saul's father comes to Saul and he says I want you to get a couple of servants and go and find those uh, 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 animals that I lost here we have the character of Saul here we have the character within the character of Saul we find him to be obedient to his father we, uh, that he was willing to help his father out willing to work on those things that his father would have and we look a little bit at uh, Saul, his uh, demeanor and his, his character and nature. We see this man was a very tall man and a very good-looking man. The Bible tells us later on that Saul stood head and shoulders over the rest of the Israelites. He was a tall man. And he was a proud man. We find that when he became king, some of his character flaws began to uh, 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 come out that he was, uh, he was this type of person that, you know, he, he wanted to be recognized and he wanted to be, he wanted to be known as, I, you know who I am, I'm the king. But in his early years, we see that God had placed within him these characters that allowed him to be obedient and go and look for his father's uh, animals. He came to uh, town and he found... Uh, uh, that he had not yet found the animals. So what did he do? He went to the uh, prophet and he said, there's the prophet in town and perhaps the prophet can help me to find uh, uh, my father's uh, animals. And so he had, what was the character? What is this? This is here now, who's doing the leading? Here he is. He is uh, doing those things, perhaps that he was taught to have respect and honor for the prophets and for people and, and, and to look to them and that they would help them to help him along in the things that he couldn't understand. So he is doing those things. He goes to the prophet. Soon as the prophet sees him, boing! He said, there's the man that God has chosen. Look at that. There he is. There's the one right there. And so Saul was well on his way. But we look at this story and we say, wow, Look at this character. Could you imagine him as a young man living with his father over there and raising those uh, uh, cattle or sheep or whatever they had and, and uh, probably thinking in his life, I have no future, this is me, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to be a farmer, I'm going to live over here, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. He didn't do anything it's seemingly to run for king. He didn't run for king. And yet God had portioned, God had put within him this position that he should be the king. And so our condition of life, and one of the things that uh, if we're looking for employment, you know, we're looking to be employed somewhere, that God sometimes has a portion for us. And if we are obedient and we follow what after what, the things that God would have us to do, then God opens the door and boom, there we are. We've, we've accomplished those things. And I'm saying this concerning Saul because I want you to see that Saul, although he seemed like he was on a track doing his thing, that God had a plan in his life, that God was working and ministering his life, and God finally gave him a portion, which happened to be a large portion, the king of Israel. In our second illustration, we have Rachel. Rachel uh, uh, here is a, a young maiden. She lives in a house with many women, many young, many sisters and brothers and a big family. And she's just one of the family. As a matter of fact, she's one of the younger ones, one of the younger girls. Now, in the Is Israeli and in the Eastern uh, 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 traditions, the 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 young people as they grow up, we know that the first male had the double portion of everything that was to be given, and then we have the the second uh, in the family, and so on, and and 
Least of all of those that would receive anything were the women in the families. They, they, they were like uh, almost, hate to say it, but they were like a second class citizen. And then can you imagine, can you imagine that if you're not the oldest daughter, if you're one of the younger daughters, you're like, you're like uh, a penny waiting for change. I mean, you're just there. You're not, you're not, the, you're just in the family. And in many cases, these uh, young people, they have no, uh, uh, unless uh, they have their own personal ambitions, it, they are just, they've resigned themselves to the fact, look at me, look where I am. And this poor young woman, Rachel, she, what was she doing? She was going to the well to feed her father's sheep. She was just a, a little shepherd girl who was bringing the sheep there, and she would bring the sheep and wait for somebody to take the cover off from the well. And so let's, uh, this is such a good story. It's found in the book of Genesis. And let me see if I can locate this and we'll read a little bit here from this. This is such a good story. And this is showing us the portion that if you have, it seems like you don't have anything going for you in this life. And it seems like everybody's against you. And it seems like you have no hope. And yet, God has a plan in your life and God has a portion for you. Uh, Jacob went out on his journey in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 29 and went out on a journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked and beheld a well in the field and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of the well uh, they watered the flocks and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither there was all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the mouth of the well, and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. And Jacob said unto them, My brother, my brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. You, you want to call this a coincidence? Huh? You want to say, oh, here's a coincidence. Look at this. And while Jacob happens to find himself at this well, here uh, and asks about Laban, he sa uh, they, they says, Lo and look, behold, here comes Rachel. Now, here comes Rachel. Here comes this young lady. She it seems like she's got nothing in life except maybe live her whole life as a, a sheep herder and, and just a, a member of the family, you know. And here uh, he's... And, and, um, and, and verse 7, And he said, Lo, it is uh, yet high day, neither it is the time of the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until, uh, until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the a well's mouth then we will water the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled a stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. <clears throat> I often use this illustration of the New Testament when we read the story of the death of Lazarus, and Lazarus, the Bible says, laid for uh, four days in the tomb, and uh, he came to the, to the tomb, Jesus, and he said to the people, he said, roll away the stone. And they said, roll away the stone? It was not opportune. It was not the right time. It was not the right place. His bodies will smell. And yet Jesus said, it's time, roll away the stone. And here we find the story in the Old Testament of Jacob, who comes at an inopportune time, and he rolls away the stone to feed Laban's uh, sheep. Here it says, And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, his daughter of Laban, the mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban and his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and he wept. Wow! Wow! 
He had found somebody. Not only had he had come to his family, but he found this young maiden. And the meeting of these two people would change everything. It would change everything. Who was Rachel? And what children did she have? She had two children. She had one named Joseph and one named Benjamin. And Joseph became the man who saved Egypt uh, from uh, uh, the famine. And not just Egypt, but the whole world at that location. That because God had gifted uh, Joseph and had, had touched Joseph's heart and had showed Joseph the dreams of the Pharaoh, that Joseph was able to save the crops from seven years to be able to go through the famine. And you know what? If this was all because God had a plan and a portion for these people's life. And he had to bring Rachel. God had to bring Rachel to the well. Just as God had brought uh, 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 Saul to, to the prophet. And now we read the third case. We find uh, Levi, who is called Matthew. And he was just a, a tax collector. Oh, he, you know, the tax collectors were those, they were such a hated people. Nobody liked these people, you know. And, and uh, I wonder what his thoughts were in his mind as he was going, getting up in the morning. He gets his paperwork together and he starts out on the road. He's going to this place where he would go to collect the taxes as the people came and went into the town, you know. And maybe along the way, he would he got uh, uh, some some uh, uh, bad language hollered at him, and, and maybe some people thought, well, oh, there's that lousy tax collector again. I'm using the word lousy, but maybe they had another term for him. You know, have you ever had people that just didn't like you? You know, and you thought, well, where where am I going in life? This one doesn't like me. That one doesn't like me. And poor Levi, you know, he goes up to the uh, to the place uh, and he begins to collect the taxes. You know. And uh, maybe in his mind he's thinking, you know, I've been doing this here, he says, all my life. He says, I have nothing to show for it, and, uh, really, and, uh, in my life. Uh, my, my, uh, my own people don't like me, and this and that and the other, and look where I am. Where am I going to end up? What's going to happen to me? And while all these thoughts and things were going on in his mind, one day Jesus came walking by. And, you know, it's just like that with you and me. We're about our business. We seem to be going through life, and, and, and uh, life is uh, sometimes such a humdrum, you know. And uh, we wonder, is this my portion in life? And sometimes we just get to the point where we think that, well, this is what God, this is my portion. This is the thing that I have in my life. And you're just on the road. You haven't really met your portion yet because God has a great portion for you if you will only listen to the voice and so Jesus walks by Levi one day and he says to Levi come and follow me come and follow me you know Jesus is calling come and follow me you have a job you have a position you have a thing going on in your life and and you seem to like the humdrum of life is just passing you by oh I get up in the morning I go to the store I go over here I do this I do that I have a cup of coffee everything seems to be humdrum in the life but God has a portion I'm telling you God has something for you in your life and then what happened to uh, Levi uh, there were tax collectors in those days even after the days of the apostles and the tax collectors would still be there Every morning they would go out and they would be collecting their taxes. But there was one man who would not be there anymore. He quit that party. He quit that group. He quit that number and he joined a smaller group of band of 12. He became one of 12. But being that one of 12, he became a well-known man. As a matter of fact, you can't open the New Testament Bible without hearing his name every time you do. And his name is Matthew. <laughs> Matthew. He's the first, right? And this man, so he became a man of God. The, and so we see that he, he had a job and he had a portion, but God come in and changed his portion. Just as God changed Rachel and as God changed Saul. They thought that this is what this is my lot in life. This is what's going to happen to me. But one day, God came along and fulfilled the portion and gave them something.
Now we talk about riches, you know, and the problem with riches. And I'd like to turn to the book of Psalms. And uh, in Psalms 52, in, in the, in the uh, book of Psalms in 52, it's only a few verses. The whole uh, chapter, I think it's only seven or eight verses, nine verses. I want to read the whole thing because then we won't get it out of context. Why boastest thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue divideth mischief like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good and lying rather than speaking righteous, Salah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away, and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place, and root thee out of the land of the living. Here is the here is in the first part of this chapter, we find God uh, speaking to those who uh, have that harsh tongue, who live by the tongue, who live by their riches, who live by the things of this life, who have chosen a portion, who have chosen something and say, this is the best, this is what I want. But here the scripture is telling us that one day, you don't know when, but sooner or later, you're going to have to get caught by the alligator. And so here is what happened. Uh, look what where we are now. That God says that I'm going to pluck you out of the land of the living. Verse 6. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, now verse 7, this is it. And lo, this is the man that made not God his strength but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Here is the problem with riches. God can give you riches. We read it in Ecclesiastes as the riches that God gives you. But if you allow the riches, if you allow those riches to become your defense, if your strength is in those riches, if your dependence is upon those riches, the Bible says that you will come to a bad end. It says that low, that it says, but he trusted in the abundance of his riches and the strengthened himself in his wickedness. Verse 8, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it and I will wait on thy name for it is good before thy saints. Here is the difference now that although God may uh, give us a portion of riches that we must learn that those riches came from God and so that we cannot trust in the riches but there's something greater to trust. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Boy, we use a drummer on this one. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Praise the Lord. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. And here we go. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now, listen. God gives us all good things to enjoy. We can enjoy the things that God has given us, but we should never allow them or put our trust in them. Verse 18, They that do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. And so we must learn not to trust in riches. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 28, it says not to trust in riches or the power of your tongue. It won't help you. He that trusts in his riches, Proverbs says, he that trusts in his riches shall fall. You're not going to make it. So trusting in God, we have to learn to put our faith and put our trust in God and through the things that, through all the portions that God has given us. Now when we look at the three characters that I mentioned of them, Saul, you know, God had given him the great portion and uh, we see that what had he done with that portion? He did some good things and he did some bad things. So his portion was, it's how and what we do with the portion that God gives us. We must learn, number one, we must learn to accept the portion, accept the portion that God has given you. God has given us each a portion. And when you look on others and you say, I wish I had what that person had, then you're breaking the law of God because that's, that's breaking the uh, commandment on uh, 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 wishing to, to gain the things that belong to someone else. You shouldn't do that. But, but concentrate on the things that God has given us. And God will tune those things and hone those things and, and we will have those things because they are special to our character and nature. That's what God has for us. Okay. Now, we must learn to put God, put Him, put Him first in our life, put Him in our life. Allow the things that God has given us and allow the, the riches or whatever God has given us. It may not be money, it might be talent, it might be skill, it might be something, some ability that God has placed in your life it is your portion of life. And I learn, the older I get, when I see uh, in the Christian world, you know, you have some that are real calm and real quiet, and they have a way uh, of presenting the word in, a, in this nice, uh, quiet manner, you know. And then you have some that are kind of rough around the collar, they say, you know, and they speak loud and they, they, they're, they're very, uh, 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 they're, uh, like a lightning bolt, you know. And, and sometimes when people see them, oh, oh that person, he, he doesn't seem to have the love, you know, he don't have love, you know. Well, let's be careful, let's be careful, because God has given a portion to all of us. You know that not everybody could be John the Baptist. Remember how when uh, John began to preach and the Pharisees came? Now, the Pharisees today, who are they? They're the religious people of this day who have who think that they're going to gain entry into the kingdom of God by their good works. And so we have a, a, a number of those who they might be. And there are some in the church who say, well, you know, we have to love them. We have to be careful with them. We have to kind of love them into the kingdom. Well, John the Baptist loved them into the kingdom, all right? He says, you brood of vipers. He says, who has warned you and to escape the, the hell damnation? He says, if you don't repent of your sins, you're going to hell. Wow. And some people would say, oh, well, he didn't say that in love. Come on, that was John the Baptist. That was the ministry of John the Baptist. That was his portion in life. And each of us have a portion in the household of God. Some are quiet. And some are very noisy. And when the noisy ones, you know, when I've had people tell me, oh, you ought to tell that person that he's got to learn to calm down. You know what I t say? I say, go. That's his job. That's what the Holy Spirit has given up him. And uh, God knows what he's doing. I'm not going to interfere with a portion that God has given that person. And let God deal with that. Believe in God's riches. 
believe that the things that you have Others may disdain. They may say, oh, that person, you know. But believe that the things that God has given you, he's given you. Believe in the portion that God has given you. Accept the portion that God has given you. And now, while you're accepting the portion that God has given you, you're not to rely on that portion. You're to rely upon the riches of God. And here's the riches of God. The riches of God is the hope that God has given to the church. The greatest hope and the greatest words that God has presented to us. I believe, I believe that when we read in the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, Believe ye in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Wow! See, that's the riches of God. That's not something that is in your portion, but it can become your portion. See, you can be, you can entertain that, you can receive that, you can accept that, you can come within that. See, I wonder one morning when Rachel got up and and maybe wasn't feeling like obeying her father, listening to her father, and her father said, "Take the sheep, go on up and water them." Okay, I'll go. And here she's got these sheep and she's going up there, you know. And they're every day, same thing. I got to do the sheep. All the sisters, all the brothers, everybody in the household, and they leave me to do this thing. I'm Because I'm one of the younger ones, they're taking advantage of me. Wham! She gets up there and here comes Jacob. Jacob takes one look at her and he says, Da-da! That's what I've been looking for. Huh? Wow. Wow. Listen to this now. Rachel was the riches of God for Jacob. Rachel was the portion of God for Jacob. And Rachel was the portion for Israel. For all of Israel, not just Jacob, but for all. Because she would have a son who would not only save Israel, but save Egypt and save all the unsaved people. Huh? Jesus comes along. Jesus is our portion. Jesus is the one who comes and says, come and follow me. He is our portion. He is our salvation. He is our hope. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you shall be also. Wow. What a promise. That promise, that is our portion, spiritual portion, and our spiritual hope for tomorrow. While God gives us the things in this life, and while we enjoy the things of this life, you know, uh, uh, sometimes I just sit under the tree in the backyard for a few minutes and I, I just, uh, the breeze is blowing and I'm sitting there, you know, in my uncut grass or my cut grass back there and I'm sitting back there. Ah, wow. Wow, this is great. I'm enjoying the riches that God has given me. Hmm? And yet... I cannot trust in them. Because just the way the wind blows, one day God is going to blow all that stuff away from me. Take it away from me. And give it to someone else. Someone else will have it. We don't know who. We, it's not in our mind or in our thoughts to think of those things. Rely upon the riches of God. Put your trust in the riches of God. And think on your portion that God has given you in your life. Amen? Let's stand together. There's much more that we could say about this, but I think I've come to the point in the circle where I say, okay, I think I've said enough. We can chew on these things, and God will uh, give us another beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for these examples that we have from your word, Lord, of how that you have uh, intervened in the lives of these people. Lord, and you have directed their paths and given them a portion that they could never dream in their wildest dreams that you would do for them. 
And Lord, we know that you have these portions and these things for us in our lives, Lord. And we cannot even think of the things or the dreams or the places that you want to put us or the things that you want to do in our lives. But you have this plan. You have this portion that you are going to give to us. And Lord, we accept those portions. Lord, one of those mansions in your kingdom belongs to me. It belongs to this congregation. It belongs to the people of God. And Lord, we want those promises. We want those portions. We want those things. Lord, not just as a promise in this life, but Lord, we want to be there, Lord, when the trumpet blows. And Lord, when you have come to get your own, we want to be an, among that number. Lord, help us that we might do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Wash us, we pray, with your precious blood. Forgive us of our sins and our trespasses. Lord, help us that we can learn to love one another and to be opened to the movement that you want to do in our life. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. And everyone said, Amen. Praise the Lord. You're dismissed this morning. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank something that I came across and I want to read it to you uh, uh, I came across this little poem that I wrote and I, I completely lost this piece of paper it was in my study and I had some drawings on it that I had drawn and it's as you can see I have all my drawings on this but I had this little piece little poem that I wrote and this was written back uh, on the 12th month on the 11th day of 1990 I wrote this poem and so <clears throat> it goes like this the poem is called just another day today is just another day the markets in a bustle people rushing here and there my there's quite a hustle some are going to church today a marriage there I think all the pomp and famous ones have gathered for a drink. The sun is shining, not a cloud, a pleasant day, I'd say. Time to walk the dog around, 
or take nine holes today. I heard that some are planning a week and at the lake, and the church on Genesee is planning for a bake. Oh, just around the corner, Christmas on the way, more shopping, singing, having fun. It's just another day. But there's something different in the air, a quiet sort of breeze. It says to watch and pray instead. Be ready, if you please. Then there, that strange small cloud rising from the east. Closer, closer comes the cloud upon these men who feast. And there it looks like, oh no, I'm sure it cannot be. A man standing in the cloud. What is this my eyes do see? Now I hear a blast so loud. I cover up my ears. That trumpet sound has touched my soul and brought my eyes to tears. A million angels suddenly appear and fill the morning sky. I beat my breast and cry aloud and in my heart a heavy sigh. I see the graves are broken up and bodies coming out. They're going up and singing too. What is this all about? And some I know, in less a time before my eye could twinkle, are dressed in white and taken up. They have no spot or wrinkle. The sadness of the moment, I'm overcome in fear. The Lamb has come and taken home the church he loves so dear. They told me to be ready. I thought I had some time to live my life and have a wife and even spend my dime. How foolish now it seems to me to miss this faithful call. For just a passing fancy, I'm sure I missed it all. Oh, how often did they beg me to ask the Savior in? But I would tell them, later I'll repent of all my sin. And they would tell the story. He's coming back, they'd say. I didn't think that he would come just another day. We never know. We never know what day the Lord has picked. And the Bible says that we ought to be ready every day. We ought to be ready for his coming. Okay? And don't think, well, tomorrow, tomorrow will be my day. Tomorrow will be the time that I will have, that I will spend with the Lord. But today, I, today I'm busy with some things. Today I just don't have the time. Now Jesus is the only way. He's the only name you'll hear on that day. What price will you bring when you stand before the King? Folks, the only way.